Hi, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, today we are going to have uh, Marzina Rostak presenting innovation in decentralized markets. Uh, like just, just go through our format. Uh, so we are going to have a 60 minutes presentation followed by a 15 minutes uh, Q&A. Uh, we have, a, I, will try, I will moderate the talk with help of uh, Zach and Brianna. We have uh, a, a group of panelists that are here to like they can stop the, the talk at any time to ask questions, clarify or, or make any comments. And we have our attendees. Our attendees, please, you feel free to use uh, the Q&A feature of Zoom at any time. And we are trying to bring the, the questions uh, during the talk or at the end. Uh, in the end, you can also use the raise hand feature if you want to talk, to, uh, have a, if you have a question and you want to ask it live in the last 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, thank you again for coming and thank you all, all our panelists and Marzana, uh, you can take over. I'll stop sharing. Can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Um, thank you for having me. Um, this work is joined with Jihyun. Uh, who is now at the new Center for Finance at UCL and is also here today. Um, the results I'll present are part of our longer term project, which um, grew out of thinking about innovation in uh, financial market design, in particular innovation in market keying technology and financial product design, and how some of it is at odds with a couple of assumptions in a standard model of financial markets. Um, mainly the assumption that financial markets are perfectly competitive and the trading is centralized. So, um, in this project, um, we take seriously the most basic features of the data, which I can keep brief in this seminar series. So we've known at least since the mid eighties when individual trade level data became available, that um, financial markets are dominated by large institutional investors who do have price impact, uh, routinely estimated and taken into account when trading. Since then, um, new data has highlighted the extent to which trading is fragmented or uh, decentralized. Essentially, all financial assets are traded in a variety of coexisting uh, trading venues of various kinds, uh, often for the same traders and assets. Um, our goal in this project is uh, to understand the potential for fragmented markets to create gains from trade from innovation of new financial products, I think of synthetic products uh, or innovation in market clearing technology, which will become apparent as soon as we relax the assumption of centralized trading, but which intuitively would not even be well-defined uh, if trading were centralized. Okay, so more specifically, um, we ask the following questions. Uh, can we identify decentralized market effects which have no centralized market counterparts and which could motivate uh, innovation. And second, when is innovation in fragmented markets actually efficient given that uh, it uh, alters the market structure? Right. So our paper is part of the growing literature on decentralized trading, um, which has put forward arguments in favor of and uh, against uh, market fragmentation. And so many people here have contributed to our thinking also for markets other than financial. And this slide cannot possibly uh, be self-contained. Um, we'll contribute a new argument to that discussion. Um, allowing for a trader's price impact is a main characteristic of fragmented markets uh, whose role we'd like to uh, underscore. In practice, um, dealing with a uh, trader's price impact uh, is often a primary motivation to set up an alternative trading protocol or to a product. So the fact that traders are non-negligible in the market might matter for understanding uh, innovation. All right, so ideally, we would like to write down a model which can directly nest the standard centralized market model for divisible assets based on the a canonical uniform price mechanism in which traders submit price contingent demand and supply schedules. Uh, now, a lot is happening in this literature right now, um, but still, even for centralized trading, most of what we understand about equilibrium with large traders has been established in a variant of a quadratic Gaussian setting, 
uh, which will also assume, so agency two leads are quadratic, uh, all random variables are jointly normally distributed. You'll see that this is not critical to the types of conclusions I'll emphasize. Um, so the description of preferences and assets is a standard. Um, agents, whether quasilinear and quadratic in the quantity traded uh, QI utility, trade multiple divisible risky assets with the covariance matrix sigma. Um, traders derive utility from their post-trade allocation, which is the sum of the initial units they hold. I'll call these endowments and trade QI. Uh, so these endowments are traders' private information. I know how many units I hold. I do not know the positions of others and are independent across traders and assets. Um, so there is a risk sharing motive and a diversification motive from trade. Uh, these endowments are heterogeneous. It's all completely standard. And the only assumption of the centralized market model we uh, intend to relax is that trading is centralized. It is uh, helpful to consider uh, carefully what exactly the centralized market assumption entails. So let's try to think for a moment. What do we assume when we take an off-the-shelf model of uh, centralized trading? Well, the essence of centralized trading in a standard model is not centralized or decentralized implementation, but rather that there is a single market clearing for all traders and all assets. And in particular, uh, two assumptions are implicit in a centralized market assumption. One is that trader participation in the market is complete in the following sense. Each trader trades all assets with all other investors. Okay, so naturally, this assumption has been relaxed by the large literature on decentralized trading based on random graphs or fixed graphs or other models with limited participation. Now, there is at least one other assumption implicit in the centralized market assumption. Okay, so when, when trading is decentralized, uh, we need to be explicit. We as modelers need to be explicit uh, or a market designer needs to be explicit or a trading protocol needs to be explicit about the types of demand schedules allowed. Is imagine I'm participating in a market with uh, two exchanges, each for one asset, let's say the same asset. Should the demand I'm submitting in one exchange allow me to condition on the price from the other exchange? Um, in other words, should I be submitting a fully contingent schedule, uh, R2R, uh, R2R2, R2, excuse me, <laughs> uh, in which the quantity of each asset is a function of the price vector, or I should be submitting two uncontingent schedules, R2R, uh, with the quantity of each asset being a function of the price of that asset alone. Okay, um, so I... Uh, two recent papers by Daniel and Darrell and Milena, uh, some of whom are also here, uh, looks at uncontingent schedules. And there is also an earlier paper by Giovanni Sespa. But um, the standard uh, model of financial markets, a uh, competitive or imperfectly competitive, um, assumes fully contingent schedules, you know, which in practice represent cross asset condition possibilities that are available in some, but not too many trading protocols. Um, more typically, an order placed for an asset cannot be made contingent on prices of other assets. Um, if allowed, such cross-asset conditioning uh, applies to a limited number of assets. Okay, so we see cross-asset conditioning in markets for uh, spectrum, uh, electricity, uh, some futures and options markets, um, a combination of rules, uh, uh, reg NMS, and uh, unlisted trading privileges in the US stock markets, uh, de facto implements contingent schedules. Uh, but analogous rules do not apply in markets for other asset classes or for uh, uh, the stock market outside the US. Feasibility might provide one rationale for why cross-asset conditioning uh, is not too prevalent. In fact, electronic trading platforms uh, experiment with and innovate on such orders. In this project, uh, we're going to show that if the market is designed in the right way, fully contingent schedules are weakly suboptimal. Okay, so let's take a closer look at how cross-asset conditioning matters. Okay, so today I'll be working with a market with I traders and K assets described on the previous slide uh, with K exchanges, each for one asset, at least in the beginning of the talk. All traders participate in each exchange. So the participation in the market is uh, complete. All traders trade all assets, but now they submit 
um, and contingent schedules. Okay, so what is the significance of that? Well, the assumption of fully contingent schedules in the standard model uh, requires that the demands and supplies of all traders for all assets should be aggregated simultaneously to even determine the vector of market keying prices and trades. The assumption of fully contingent schedules implies joint clearing. Okay, so apart from the identification of um, the centralized market effects, which have no centralized market counterparts, the more specific objective of this uh, project is to understand the implications of um, independence in market clearing across venues or uh, across trading protocols within trading platforms. Both can be accommodated. That's really what this notion of an exchange represents in the model independence in market clearing. Right, so that's the saying. How is the market organized? Well, in each exchange, trade takes place to the standard uniform price double auction in which traders submit price contingent demand and supply schedules. Right, so schedules are still contingent on the prices of the assets traded within an exchange. I'll work with net demand so that we don't have to talk about bias and sellers separately. The aggregate net demand equals zero determines the market key and price and uh, individual quantities are given by the submitted schedules at the market key and price. We'll work with linear uh, equilibrium of quantities and nothing I'll say relies on the presence of noise traders or not fully optimizing agents. All right, let's Ma have- Martin, Martin yes. can I ask you something? That I, something that from your work and also uh, recent work on the topic, uh, there's this message that uh, patterns of participation and in particular asymmetries of particip in participation across market matters a lot for you know, efficiency and other consideration. What are you going to do about participation or assume? Will you have asymmetries? Will they be taken as given? I just would like to know a bit uh, that dimension also. Of the, yes, absolutely. Thank uh, you for this the, question. Um, mm -hmm. um, right, so there is earlier work on uh, mm -hmm. relaxing uh, the assumption that trader participation in, in the market is symmetric or complete. Mm -hmm. Um, in this project, we completely shut down the uh, decentralized market effects due to heterogeneous participation to understand the implications of uh, uncontingent schedules uh, themselves. Um, so the idea is that by um, uh, isolating uh, the assumption of uh, heterogeneous participation and incomplete, so incomplete participation and incomplete conditioning, we can identify different decentralized market effects which have no centralized market counterparts so here traders will participate in all those markets yes okay perfect yes. i'm happy to uh, tell you what happens uh, if you allow for both but uh, um i'm hoping to convince you that uh, 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 there are new relevant effects from uh, relaxing the assumption that market clearing is joined uh, while maintaining the assumption that all traders trade all assets. Um, all, right, so, all right, so let's briefly um, uh, review the centralized market model with large traders and its key properties, which we show do not generally hold uh, with other designs. Okay, that is, let's suppose there is a single exchange for all traders and all assets um, and traders submit fully contingent schedules. All right, so in models in which traders submit price contingent demand and supply functions, um, it is useful to think of a trader as optimizing against a residual market represented by his residual supply function. This motivates a pointwise optimization problem, pointwise with respect to the realizations of the price vector, which is the contingent variable in traders' demands, and uh, which one can show is equivalent to optimization in, in schedules. All right, in the point waste problem, equilibrium is characterized by uh, two simple conditions. Um, first, each trader demand, uh, submits a demand uh, which equalizes his marginal utility prime with the marginal payment pointwise uh, with respect to the realizations of the price vector where lambda i is his price impact. And with uh, k assets, it is a k by k Jacobian matrix whose element KL represents the price change of asset L following a demand change, you know, a demand change for asset K. Um, this first set of condition of a monopolist applies to all traders. You know, all traders are uh, large, so we are working with a multilateral oligopoly model, if you will. 
if I know my price impact. I could then compute my best response schedule given that I know my marginal utility, but these price impacts are endogenous. They depend on how others bid. So the second equilibrium condition requires precisely that the price impact assumed by a trader in his pointwise optimization, which could have been arbitrary in the logic so far, is correct. That is, it matches the Jacobian of the residual inverse supply defined by aggregation of demands submitted by others, J different than I. Okay, so we have that the price impact matrix of trader I is the harmonic mean of inverse demand slopes. The harmonic mean appears from aggregation in market models. These two conditions, optimization given price impact and the requirement that the price impact should be correct given equivalent of Bayesian, Nashi, Kurobian and games in demand and supply functions. Working directly and with- I could ask a question. Yes. Um, sorry, I missed this earlier. Um, what, what generates trading motives among traders? Are they, do they have common value, private value? Uh, yeah. This is a private value model. There is a risk sharing motive and a, and a diversification motive from trade. Um, uh, endowments are heterogeneous. So I have a, I have a question. Um, Please. Pres presumably you could rotate the asset space, you know, just by replacing assets with a, um, a ma an invertible matrix that gives you some, sort of a different set of basis assets. And I suppose that the equilibrium you're giving us here is going to be unchanged if you rotate the assets. Uh, is that uh, yes? If you are uh, referring to uh, the spanning result, yes, absolutely. Uh, this is indeed the case when trading is centralized. But give me a few minutes. Okay. I will come back to that. If you allow me, um, um, I, I will come back precisely to this issue. So, of course, this uh, representation in terms of Lambda uh, goes back to, to Pete's seminal work. Uh, this is just a review slide. There is nothing new here. Um, uh, let, let, me, let me finish off with two quick remarks. The competitive model, uh, which we'll use as a benchmark, is nested here in the limit. Uh, so as the number of traders grows large, the pricing back matrices go to zero as long as the risk conversions are not increasing too fast. And second, the equilibrium condition for price impacts defines a fixed point among traders' price impact matrices. Um, when trading is centralized, the system of such I harmonic mean conditions can be solved in closed form. And the solution has a property which turns out to have important implications for how centralized markets function. So here's the solution. It tells us that the price impact matrix of every trader is proportional to the fundamental covariance matrix. This proportionality coefficient beta i can be characterized as a function of the primitives, all traders' risk preferences, and the number of traders. I didn't put it on the slide because the point here is that it's a scalar. Um, um, okay, so where does price impact come from at a primitive level? From the payoff concavity of uh, the traders' residual market. And when trading is centralized, the link between price impact and fundamental risk is quite particular. It is linear. Martina, is, is there a uniqueness here? There is a unique linear equilibrium. Yes. Good. Thank you for us. All right. With that, um, for the same uh, traders and assets, let's now consider a multi venue design. Okay, so think of an individual optimization problem of a trader in a um, uh, decentralized market with K exchanges, each for an asset, who submits uncontingent schedules. His objective function is the same, and so is his information set, the privately known endowment vector. Um, what changes is the choice variable. Now the demand for each asset is contingent on and hence measurable with the price of that asset alone. There's an analogous pointwise optimization problem, now pointwise only with respect to the realizations of the price of asset K. All right, uncontingent, schedule, uh, uncontingent schedules or independence in market clearing affect the trader's first order conditions in two ways. At first, the cross asset price impact becomes zero. Okay, so by the definition of uncontingent schedules, when I increase my demand for assets K, the margin, I no longer expect the prices of other assets to change. So in contrast to a centralized market where the price impact of every trader is proportional to the fundamental covariance matrix, uh, the price impacts of all traders are diagonal. 
Now, even though the cross asset price impact is eliminated, um, the equilibrium outcome prices and trades are not independent across exchanges, uh, in which case the mar market would operate de facto as a collection of independent venues. This is the case so long as the uh, payoff Hessian uh, sigma is not separable, in which case the sigma k elements will be equal to zero and my marginal utility for asset k would be independent of trade of other assets. Now, second, uh, when trading is uncontingent, my demand for asset K can no longer condition on um, the realized trades of other assets, okay, but it still depends on expected trades. Okay, to be sure, why does it? My endowments are independent across assets. Uh, but again, my valuation is not, as long as the Hessian is not separable. Uh, but now equilibrium won't be exposed. Okay, so which makes the problem um, more interesting. So equilibrium can still be characterized with the familiar conditions, um, optimization given the residual supply and the requirement that residual supply should be correct. Um, but now um, the price impact is no longer a sufficient statistic for the residual market. The distribution matters as well. And uh, because of uh, the cross asset inference, uh, the conditional expectations across assets and price impacts across traders define a complex fixed point. Um, I would like to spend more time on the design part uh, in this seminar uh, rather than the solution method. So let me just say uh, uh, what we do without telling you how we do it. <laughs> so we, we show that the equilibrium fixed point in uh, demand schedules is equivalent to a fixed point in price impact matrices once the problem is written in matrix form. That is, we endogenize all of the demand coefficients, including conditional inference, as functions of price impacts themselves. This not only makes the problem uh, fantastically tractable, but also allows us to develop the comparative analysis across the size through the structure of the equilibrium price impact matrix itself, which I have yet to characterize. Okay, so far, I only told you that the cross asset price impacts become zero um, by the definition of uncontingent schedules. Well, it turns out that the price impacts within the exchanges generally differ from their contingent market counterparts due to cross asset inference. So we have a comparative static result, but let me just mention one but that I need to return to the welfare part. Um, our I have another question. So yeah. what about the market makers, or I guess in this case, exchanges, are they kind of risk neutral competitive? Uh, how are they setting the price, the market clearing price? Sorry if I missed this. Uh, so in each exchange, trade takes place to the standards, uniform price double auction. Okay. Um, we uh, abstract away from the incentives of market makers here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. focus on traders. So uh, Marjana, another uh, question. Uh -huh. So it looks like in these models, there are two types of assumptions that are made. One is about the pricing mechanism. So that leads to zero uh, cross exchange in price impact. So the fact that you know the, the, the price in market K only depend on quantity submitted in that, in that market. But there seem to be assumption about information too, you know, so that I submit my demand without knowing anything about what happened in other markets. It looks like in a dynamic version of this model that would be could be different. So if market open one after the other, or perhaps there could be, you know, Grossman Stiglitz type of equilibrium concept where you submit your demand, you know, knowing the the market clearing price everywhere. I wanted yes, to, thank you. Know, to have your uh, opinion about those two different assumptions and how they matter. This is an excellent result. point. This is an excellent point. So uh, you might say, well, um, even though I, I cannot uh, condition my demand for asset K on um, the prices of other assets um, in a given round, nobody can prohibit me from conditioning my demands on past prices uh, from any exchanges as long as these prices are uh, available. And, and that's exactly correct. Um, so does cross asset conditioning matter? Um, well, the ability to condition on um, past prices um, allows traders to incorporate information uh, 
from past shocks, whether traders, whether demands are contingent or uncontingent. Okay. The ability to condition on, on the prices of simultaneously placed orders allows uh, traders to incorporate information um, about uh, current round shocks. Uh, so that's really what this paper is about. And these effects will be present in every round of a dynamic market. Now, of course, uh, there is an interesting question. Uh, can we find conditions under which um, a dynamic market would, uh, would implement uh, fully contingent schedules? Um, so we don't have this result. There is, there is a conjecture that um, that result will depend on the relative frequency of trade um, and um, uh, shocks to information or shocks that renew gains from trade. Okay, so intuitively, if the trading frequency is sufficiently high, uh, one might expect that in the limit, uh, uh, the equilibrium would mimic uh, the contingent market equilibrium, but not otherwise. I mean, we've been um, hearing so much about high frequency trading for the past few years, but uh, it is, it is uh, useful to remember that a large fraction of trade still takes place at low frequencies. So these effects will be relevant. So in your RFS paper, you have conversions to first best, right? Uh, in the, if you have many yeah, uh, trading uh, period in between shocks uh, to endowments or something like that. That's right, that's right. I mean, these issues are not present in any form. I mean, that, that model is based on contingent schedules. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I wanna just a follow up on this because if you, if you think about like two rounds, you're talking about, oh, it's like, this is a model for each particular round. But the, if you think about the, there is no shock between two rounds. So the, the shock itself is the price from the previous round. So like what I'm trying to say is like the information that arrives in the second round might be just the bid of the other traders in the first round, which would distort the incentives to bid in the first place. Do you, know, do, do you understand what I mean? Is like, if you, if you have a strategic game, then now I, I care about what would be the price impacts, not just in the current period, given my, my bid, but what's gonna be the price impact of my bid in the, in the follow-up periods. Uh, yes, absolutely. So two, uh, two answers. It models with multi-unit demands. Uh, um, traders need multiple runs from trade to uh, exhaust gains from trade from any given shock. Uh, so if you give me an additional round, I will I will trade. Um, uh, and 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 to your point about the interaction between uh, the price impact within each round uh, with uh, with the dynamics, yes, that, that, that's an, another reason why uh, uh, it is not obvious if uh, a dynamic market with uncontingent schedules will will produce uh, um, the contingent outcome. So that's that's actually uh, that, that interaction between the within round price impact and and the across round price impact is is non trivial. All right, let me just uh, put yes. yeah. one more question, um, and I'm going back to the static models. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, if they were to have a choice, if tr if traders were to have a choice between submitting contingent schedules and uncontingent schedules. What would they do? And I'm not saying they should have a choice, but no, that's a uh, that's a that's an excellent question. That's a very relevant point. So it is useful to distinguish between the incentives of individual traders and exchanges, right? So uh, uh, individual optimization entails that if if you give me um, a, a choice uh, to submit a contingent or uncontingent schedules. I will, I will choose to submit contingent schedules. Uh, uh, however, uh, as will become apparent very soon, uh, exchanges generally do not have incentives to allow for uh, contingent schedules. And that's in fact the pre prevalent, prevalent practice. Uh, and when you mean exchanges, you mean from a welfare perspective? Because you said market makers yes, are not. I, I mean, I will, I will focus on welfare, but if you endow exchanges with uh, an objective to maximize profit, liquidity, or, okay. or, um, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, yet another objective, uh, they generally do not have incentives to allow for contingent schedules. That's going to be an implication of 
um, of, of our main welfare results. Thank you. All right, so the last bit that I wanted to mention here is that in general, price impacts within the exchanges can be higher or lower compared to their contingent market counterparts because of cross-asset inference effects, which um, our instinct tells us depend on the complementaries and susceptibilities in the asset payoffs, which can be arbitrary here, as long as uh, sigma is a covariance matrix. All right, let's go back to the motivating question. Why might we expect a market with multiple exchanges that clear independently to be more efficient than a single exchange which clears all assets jointly. If the market were competitive, uh, the contingent design would be weakly most efficient uh, as it would eliminate the information loss across assets. Okay, so the key is that independent market clearing can lower the trading costs uh, of price impact and increase welfare despite the information loss. Okay, so that's where the possibility comes from. But is the contingent design going to be generally inefficient in imperfectly competitive markets? And what exactly can we say, given that the comparative static uh, result from the previous slide suggests that um, the price impact within exchanges may or may not be uh, lower with independent market clearing. In addition, uh, the zero cross asset price impact may or may not be conducive to efficiency. Okay, so for a quick example on that, uh, let's think of a market with two assets and a positive covariance, the pay of substitutes. Recall that when trading is centralized, the price impact matrix is proportional to the fundamental covariance matrix. So the cross asset price impact inherits the sign of the covariance. It is positive in the example. So for traders who are interested in taking the same position in both assets, the cross asset price impact increases the trading costs. Now, naturally, in the same example, a negative covariance and hence a negative uh, cross asset price impact will lower the trading costs. But the point is that these effects are absent with a uh, multi venue trading. Okay, so, in contrast to the competitive market, the characteristics of traders and assets matter for which design is efficient. And uh, even just letting assets clear independently can increase welfare in some trading environments, which one can characterize through joint conditions on the primitives. Now, a, a more subtle point, and perhaps one of the main results uh, in this paper is that if the market is suitably designed, um, a multi-venue design can always be at least as efficient as the contingent design uh, for all uh, preferences and joint distribution of, of the asset payoffs. So this possibility um, has to do with innovating new financial products and the introduction of additional exchanges for traded assets um, and other types of innovations which are not even well defined when trading is centralized. Okay, so the, the broader point here is that once we dispense with the assumption that uh, all assets clear jointly, several instruments in financial market design become available which will either be neutral or have no counterparts with centralized trading. Well, we study these um, innovations in separate papers. I, I will highlight the main observations, um, but first let's extend the basic and contingent model in two ways to accommodate uh, more general market structures and these different types of innovations. Okay, so first let's allow for arbitrary demand conditioning between uncontingent and contingent. Uh, so now the demand for each asset can be uh, contingent on any subset of prices. This allows multiple assets per exchange. In addition, let's allow an asset to uh, be traded in multiple venues. So the market is still described by a collection of exchanges, each for a subset of assets. Traders submit demands that are contingent on the prices of the assets traded within an exchange and contingent across exchanges. Um, so the market still clears exchange by exchange, not necessarily asset by asset. The equivalence between the equilibrium fixed point and uh, in schedules and the fixed point in price impact matrices carries over to these more general market structures. Now price impacts are block diagonal matrices. All right, so here's an example which motivates the study of these different types of innovation. Suppose that, um, um, 
one of the key assets is duplicated uh, to be traded along with the existing assets without altering any traders and downloads. When would we expect an innovation of the sort to not be neutral? Well, not in a competitive market with contingent demands. Okay, so that's the classical result. Introducing assets in the span of the existing assets is redundant. It does not change the equilibrium utilities. And so asset diversification depends only on the asset span, but not the asset structure. Now, in practice, um, new venues, new trading protocols, or new financial products are uh, added in for tax related purposes. Uh, they are used for information related reasons, so we could say because of some form of marketing completeness, um, or uh, to increase liquidity to lower price impact. So let's suppose that the market is imperfectly competitive. Essentially, there's a finite number of traders and demands are still contingent. Well, the spanning results continue to hold. Okay, so the quickest way to see it is to look at the first order conditions uh, in the contingent model we set up earlier, where subscript plus denotes the pay of distribution uh, following the introduction of the new asset. Collecting terms with trade on the left-hand side and using, once again, that when trading is centralized, the price impact matrix of every trade is proportional to the fundamental covariance matrix, which is singular by construction after we introduce the new asset. We see that there is a continuum of solutions, including zero trade. So even if the new asset is traded, it won't change anybody's utilities. Um, let me make sure it is clear what the exercise here is. So there are results in early competitive theory telling us that introducing assets outside the span of the traded assets would not be redundant. Right? So if the existing asset structure spans a subspace, introducing assets in the complement of that subspace would not be redundant. And clearly these results will carry over to imperfectly competitive environments, but that's not what we are doing here. We are introducing assets um, in the span. And once we acknowledge that it is not the case that all assets clear jointly, um, the spanning results no longer hold in particular, there are non redundant innovations. And if suitably designed, they can increase welfare. And you can see that the reason is once again, that independent market clearing savors the link between price impact and uh, uh, the covariance between incentives and risk. Mazina, um, can I, can I um, ask about the intuition here? So my understanding that why the having the uncontingent orders might be more efficient is that um, in the in the in the price impact models, people try to avoid price impact, so they trade too slowly. So the way to deal with that is to shut out price impact, so that the people will not be uh, trading too slowly. They would trade more aggressively because artificially there's no price impact across the market. Um, so so Darren and I have worked on this paper on size discovery that for a single asset, you can shut out price impact temporarily over time. I think what you are doing is more of a spatially, you shut out price impact across the markets. And, and I think essentially the, the, the market design you are trying to address here seems to be picking up um, which price impact you want to allow versus not allow in order to get the best uh, efficiency. You would suffer a bit of a price discovery in the process, but that seems to be a trade off there. So there is a, there is a, a very interesting question and we have nothing to say uh, uh, about that question right now. Um, um, to what extent can shredding orders dynamically substitute for shredding them across exchanges? What are the trade-offs in, 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 in market design? Um, and perhaps that's the question you're alluding to. But my, my intuition is that by uh, forcing traders to trade uh, these one assets at a time, <clears throat> you're sacrificing some information and therefore reducing some adverse selection and that gets people to trade more. Um, you would think that in a dynamic model where people are trading continuously, any, um, uh, any differences in prices that uh, reflected uh, information that hadn't gone from one market to another would be quickly uh, rectified <laughs> with sort of arbitrage trading. And therefore, reverse kind of reduce or eliminate the gains from having separate exchanges for separate assets. Uh, Pete, uh, that exact question is addressed in a paper by Daniel Chen and me um, recently. And somewhat interestingly, it turns out that the uh, the fact that I can learn from lagged price impact 
still implies that fragmentation improves market efficiency. That is, having more exchanges is still a good idea uh, with the uncontingent orders. It's kind of interesting. So what is the intuition for, for that? Uh, the intuition is, well, it only works if you have just the right number of exchanges. But if you do, um, investors learn everything from the lagged price impact. So there's no carryover, at least in a model, uh, there's no carryover uh, effect on. So each period is kind of like starting from scratch in terms of uh, in terms of shielding your um, your price impact from cross exchange orders. So you have the same kind of incentive to, sp to spread across markets and shield your orders from price impact that that how Sean mentioned. Okay. Um, let, let I got a, a question. Another question for Marzana. Um, is there an ex, is there always a existence of prices with trade, or do you have markets shutting down uh, because traders have too much market power? Uh, we don't have any existence issue. I mean, we do have an existence result. I didn't present it here. Uh, um, perhaps you're asking uh, the following. Um, are all markets going to be open or the interaction between uh, price impacts across exchanges is going to be such that uh, some, some, some markets are going to be illiquid? I'll talk about uh, um, this particular uh, problem a little bit later. Um, so let me just say one more thing. So, so I, I, Matt, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to mention uh, the result that uh, and Darrell and Daniel have about dynamic uh, markets. So, so thank you for uh, doing a much better job than, than uh, what I would have done. Um, but uh, uh, let, let me also say that uh, if uh, shocks to information are as frequent as, uh, as uh, training needs, the uncontingent model will not be equivalent to, uh, to the contingent model. I mean, that's, that's one easy case where one can see that. Um, uh, Marjane, I have a. I wanted to go back to uh, Pete's earlier question about rotation, and ask you how the problem of mitigating price impact is related to the problem of diagonalizing sigma, basically of picking asset payoffs that have no covariance. Um, yes. Right. Okay. So yeah. it's easy to do it when trading as uh, contingent or in centralized markets. Uh, you you can, in principle, diagonalize the covariance in, in, uh, uh, in markets with uncontingent schedules. Um, but uh, these factors are not going to be useful for, uh, for pricing new assets. Again, I will talk about it. Can, can I just, uh, can you give me a few minutes? Uh, and I will, I will actually talk about all of these <laughs> questions very explicitly. Um, all right, so let me just say that the lack of spanning, um, apart from uh, the introduction of new trading protocols for traded assets, the lack of spanning motivates uh, other types of innovation, such as linking trading protocols by merging uh, uh, their assets or the inclusion of a new asset in a, uh, a trading protocol where it was previously not traded. Okay, so think of asset listings. Uh, all right, so I'd like to present uh, four observations about innovation, and which, will address some of the questions you, you asked. Um, okay, so let me, let me begin with the following. Uh, should we expect innovation to be non-redundant under uh, general conditions or uh, the trading environments in which innovation is non-redundant are pretty special? Well, here's a corollary of a result I'll present later, but it is intuitive enough to be stated here. We show that in, in the uncontingent markets, so in markets where all assets clear independently, all innovations are redundant if and only if the payoffs of all assets are either perfectly correlated, in which case the inference is perfect, or independent, in which the inference doesn't matter. Otherwise, some innovations will change the equilibrium price distribution and traders' price impact. Okay, so here's a more interesting question. <clears throat> What's the scope for introducing non-redundant uh, innovations? Can, can we put a number on it? The intuition behind the general result can be seen in a simple example with uh, three assets. 
Okay, so let's consider a market with three exchanges, each for a pair of assets. Um, even though this market structure is comprised of multiple exchanges, none of which contains all assets, the equilibrium is the same as in the contingent market. Okay, so, um, in order to explain the intuition behind this example uh, and compare payoffs across arbitrary market structures, the price impacts per se are not going to be useful. They are defined on different exchanges and they can be of different dimensionality. Um, however, uh, the following observation simplifies and illuminates the analysis of uh, innovation and welfare. Let uh, the price impact per unit matrix be the K by K matrix such that the total equilibrium trade of each asset is the same as it will be in a single exchange with lambda tilde as price impact matrix. Okay, so we show that first we can relate payoffs across arbitrary market structures through a single exchange counterfactual. And second, we can identify non-redundancy of innovation with the change in that statistic. Okay, so intuitively, <clears throat> innovations are non-redundant if they change the relative trading costs across assets. Okay, so you might recall that in the competitive model, uh, innovations are non-redundant if they change relative prices, relative price levels. Here we have an imperfectly competitive counterpart of that result. Innovations are non-redundant if they change relative price impacts. Um, so back to the example. Uh, in any exchange, let's say the exchange for assets one and two, um, the demand for each asset uh, depends on expected trades of all assets. Right? These expectations are conditioned on the prices of assets one and two, which are the contingent variable in, the, in this exchange. Um, let's now look at the total demand uh, for asset one. Well, there are additional expected trade terms, which condition on a different subset of prices. Okay. In particular, uh, um, even though in no exchange can the, the demand for any asset be conditioned on the price vector, and so no trade expectations are perfect, in the total demand, the inference error is, is eliminated. It is as if traders could condition their demands on the full price vector. Okay, so we've just answered the following question. When can markets with multiple venues function as the centralized market? When innovation completes traders' inference this way. Okay, so even though these venues clear independently, equilibrium is exposed. Um, further linking uh, traders' demands or int introducing additional protocols will be redundant. Okay, so one can show that the price impact per unit matrix coincides with the price impact uh, matrix from the contingent market. In particular, it is proportional to the fundamental covariance matrix. Okay, so this shows that uh, cross exchange inference effects in the market with multiple venues exactly mimic the cross asset price impact in the single venue with contingent demands. This result also puts a bound on the number of innovations that can be introduced in markets and remain non-redundant. Okay, this result tells us that we can implement the contingent outcome with simpler demands, two assets per exchange suffice. Okay, so for the equivalence to hold, um, uh, it must be the case that for every pair of assets, there is an exchange where they are cleared to get jointly. Okay, so that number would be a K times K minus one over two. All right. Which... Can I take question? Yes. When you define uh, the innovation here with the derivative, the um, returns combination is not just for the asset in the single exchange, right? The derivative is, de is defined across asset for traded in several exchanges. Is that correct? Alberto, you're stealing my thunder. I haven't yet mentioned the about it, but I will. <laughs> so you, you're, you're way ahead of me. So for now, uh, traders are submitting contingent demands uh, within the exchanges. These demands can be conditioned on uh, a subset of prices, but they are still contingent within exchanges. Okay. Can I, can I um, ask a, a basic question? So you said earlier in a response to Anna's question that market makers and and the exchanges would not have incentives to connect these markets, for example. And now you're talking about innovation. So I wonder who you think, who would be the person doing these innovations? 
Right. I mean, these will be exchanges and generally there will be incentives to uh, introduce innovations relative to the pure and contingent uh, design where all assets clear independently and there is no innovation. What I'm trying to say is that in, um, uh, exchanges will generally not have incentives to uh, um, uh, allow for uh, fully contingent demands. Thank you, thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very important point. All right, All right. so would you- Could I just explore that a little bit further? Yes. Uh, that does seem crucial. Uh, so you're saying basically that if I run NYSE, then I would not want to make uh, execution on my exchange depend on prices set on NASDAQ, but I would want to make uh, prices on my exchange for two different assets yeah, to allow contingency across two different assets traded on my own exchange. But why wouldn't I want to steal the price information coming out of NASDAQ? Why wouldn't I say, gosh, I can lift their price information and allow my investors to use it. They'll come to my exchange to do that. And if I, if, if I don't do that, maybe NASDAQ will do that to me. So wouldn't I want to do that? You as an exchange? Uh... Me as the NY, NYSE. Wouldn't I want to get investors to come to my exchange so they can execute those wonderful cross exchange orders rather than leave that to NASDAQ and have them steal all my my volume? Well, so in the US stock market, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's in fact for the, that, that's in fact the case, right? The combination of rules, uh, reg and MS and unless the trading privileges, the facto implements uh, uh, contingent orders. Um, but uh, we don't see analogous uh, rules in, in markets for other asset classes. So these exchanges are private entities and we, we, we don't see cross uh, venue conditioning um, in, in, in practice other than uh, in the US stock market. Um, it is an interesting question uh, why that is the case, but uh, um, the results, the welfare results that I'm about to show are going to say that the incentives are not unambiguous. Thank you. All right, this is, this is actually, uh, this is an interesting slide. Which innovations are not redundant? Not all innovations are. And the answer to this question underscores the role of price impact. Okay, so we show that in, in markets with multiple venues, which clear independently, there is more innovation when traders have price impact. Um, so let's consider the following example with three assets traded in two exchanges, or assets one and two and three. Um, generally, we expect that uh, innovations which let demands for some assets be contingent on prices of additional assets, for example, the introduction of an exchange for assets two and three, to not be redundant. Okay, such innovations uh, reduce the uh, inference error for assets two and three. And if the market were competitive, would be the only type of innovation that will be non-redundant. It turns out that this is not the case when traders have price impact. So suppose that instead, a new venue for asset one is introduced in the original market. Okay, that, that new venue does not let the demand for asset one to be contingent on prices of additional assets. And it will be redundant if the market were competitive. It is generally not when traders have price impact. Okay, so we show that that new venue would be redundant if and only if the price impact matrix in the original market is symmetric. Okay, so, so far I've drawn a lot of attention to the lack of proportionality between the price impact and the fundamental covariance in uh, markets with uh, uncontingent demands. This result identifies a specific property uh, that becomes relevant. The asymmetry of equilibrium price impact uh, is a new property relative to uh, the models with both contingent and uncontingent demands, where respectively the price impact is proportional to the fundamental covariance matrix. So the cross asset uh, price impacts are tied to the covariance or the price impact matrix is diagonal. So the cross asset price impacts are zero. In general market structures, the price impact matrix is going to be symmetric only under a joint symmetry restriction on the market structure and the covariance. 
So why does uh, the asymmetry of cross-asset price impact matter for innovation? Well, intuitively, uh, for that new venue for asset one to be uh, non-redundant, it would have to be the case that the price of asset one is a different linear combination of random variables compared to the price uh, in the exchange for assets one and two. What are the random variables in this market? Well, recall that traders are uncertain about the positions of others. So these will be aggregate endowments of all assets. Um, when assets one and two, which clear jointly, are asymmetric, asymmetrically correlated with asset three, um, the inference effects with respect to asset three are going to be asymmetric. And as a result, the cross asset price impact will be asymmetric. So for a quick example, let's suppose that asset two is uncorrelated with asset three. So sigma two, three is zero. Then an increase in demand for asset one would not have any indirect inference effect between assets two and three. However, an increase in, in demand for asset two would have a non-zero inference effect. So why are these uh, cross asset price impacts important? Because they determine the uh, weights in the price function on the aggregate endowments. Okay? And with asymmetric price impacts, the price of asset one in these two venues is indeed a different linear combination of random variables. Okay, so mathematically, um, the uh, matrix weight coefficient uh, in the price function on the aggregate endowment is determined by the price impact matrix and it's transposed, which never mattered so far in models with contingent and uncontingent demands. Uh, when the price impact matrix is asymmetric, um, the weights on the aggregate endowments um, for uh, in the price for the same asset traded in different exchanges are different. Okay, so these prices indeed carry different information. All right, so the main takeaway from the slide is that in, in perfectly competitive markets, there are two types of innovation. Those that reduce the inference um, error um, by letting demands for some assets to be contingent on prices of additional assets and uh, innovations that redistribute the inference error across assets, which would be redundant in the market where competitive. What are the implications of, yeah, yes. So, okay. so can you define an optimal innovation on the derivative market based on the correlation structure of um, the underlining assets? Okay. Because I it mean, seems like this will be a finite optimization problem. We it is a difficult problem. We we do have some uh, uh, answers in 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 some uh, uh, specific trading environments, which I'll actually uh, uh, hint at uh, on this slide. Okay, so what are the implications of all of this for welfare? Um, well, we've just shown that a market with multiple trading venues can be at least as efficient as uh, uh, the contingent market. Okay, so as a matter of theory, uh, the fact that a decentralized market can be more efficient than a centralized market should not be surprising. Right? Um, but the question is, can we give any predictive results that could guide uh, uh, design? So let, let, me, let me try. And this equivalence result between multi-venue uh, markets and the contingent markets between a single exchange and markets with multiple exchanges uh, tells us that one can bound welfare at a corresponding contingent level uh, in markets for uh, any preferences and assets. Okay? So this result does not require the policy to rely on any information about uh, the joint distribution of asset payoffs on traders' preferences. Now, um, it turns out that uh, multi-venue designs can do strictly better uh, relative to uh, centralized trade. Okay, so not only can joint clearing be uh, um, unnecessary, but it may also be suboptimal. Why? We had anticipated a trade-off between information loss and price impact. We can now see the trade-off by substituting uh, uh, the equilibrium allocation as, as a function of price impact in the equilibrium utility, I mean, in the utility function to compute the indirect utility. When the market structure changes, the corresponding change in surplus can be decomposed in three terms. And due to information loss, uh, the price impact of a given asset, so the diagonal element of the price impact per unit, the price impacts across assets, so the off diagonal elements. 
Right. So fundamentally, where are the welfare uh, uh, gains from multi-value trading coming from? Since we can compare the payoffs across arbitrary market structure through the single exchange counterfactual, the diagonal and off-diagonal elements uh, represent respectively the cost of risk sharing of a given asset and the cost of diversification across assets. Okay, so we show the following. Uh, in markets with two assets, um, con the contingent design minimizes the cost of risk sharing. So for multi-value trading to uh, increase welfare, it would have to be the case that the cost of diversification is, is lowered sufficiently. However, and more generally in markets with multiple assets, multi-value trading can lower the cost of diversification or risk sharing or both. That's a direct corollary of the uh, comparative statics of price impact, which I did not present. Um, which designs are more efficient? Uh, if, if you can, like, uh, we start a little bit later, but like, if you can take like one, two minutes to, to wrap it up. We're kind of over time. All right, okay. Uh, Sorry about that. I see, thank you. Uh, let, let, me, let me try. <laughs> um, so we show that uh, neither the contingent nor the uncontingent design can be uh, are, 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 uh, efficient irrespective of market characteristics. Uh, so there are two insights here. The key primitive is the joint susceptibility of the asset payoffs, um, so the covariance matrix and the traders trading needs. You can see why they matter in the uh, equilibrium surplus. Um, so we show that even if all assets are uh, uh, pay of substitutes or complements, symmetric pay of complements or symmetric pay of substitutes, which design is optimal depends on whether the market is one sided. Uh, so traders are interested in, in buying or selling all assets, as is the case in treasury auctions, or some assets are demanded and others are supplied. Okay, so think of dealer markets. Uh, more generally, what matters is the heterogeneity in the joint uh, susceptibility, um, which can favor designs intermediate between fully contingent and non-contingent. Both these observations contrast sharply with the competitive market where um, any innovations that increase demand conditioning increase welfare, irrespective of the characteristics of traders and assets. I, I'm going to use my one minute on the derivative question. Uh, let's suppose that um, the technology to uh, uh, link market clearing for multiple assets is not available. One can still uh, ensure that multi-venue trading is at least as efficient as uh, the contingent market, regardless of traders' preferences and asset distribution. So by letting traders trade a new assets whose payoffs are defined as laying combinations of the existing assets, so these are derivative products that Alberto wanted me to talk about. Think ETFs, ETPs, or proper derivatives, which will be redundant in a contingent market. Um, um, in fact, the standard methods for pricing derivatives either assume uh, the existence of a, an exogenously given demand for a derivative product, or they assume the existence of a replicating portfolio. That is, they assume we can price new products through linear combinations of the assets that are already traded. That is, they assume that the derivatives are redundant. With innovation defined through pay of bundles rather than asset subsets, the framework from the previous slide uh, becomes an equilibrium model of non-redundant derivatives. Uh, so once again, uh, one can implement the, the contingent market allocation now with purely uncontingent schedules. And once again, one can do strictly better, but there is a new question here. Um, so in, in principle, um, a new exchange in trading technology, in market clean technology, and new uh, financial products represent alternative ways to exploit the uh, susceptibilities and complementarities in the asset payoffs. So I might ask whether uh, synthetic products could mimic the equilibrium effects um, of innovation trading technology for the same assets or vice versa. And in fact, it seems that derivatives allow for more degrees of freedom. We can choose the weights with which we bundle the asset payoffs. Okay, so, so can innovation in trading technology subs in, in, in financial products substitute for innovation in trading technology? Okay, so let's make the exercise uh, uh, more precise. Uh, given the set of traders and assets, can equilibrium in a given market structure with exchanges, in particular the payoffs and, and the liquidity the price impact, be reproduced 
state by state for all realizations of endowments by derivatives whose payoffs uh, bundle the corresponding asset subsets. Okay, we show that this is generally not possible. Uh, even if we allow for multiple derivatives for the same assets or additional derivatives for other assets. The equilibrium property I just reported on the, uh, a couple of slides ago is relevant. We show that derivatives can mimic exchanges state by state if and only if actually yields the symmetric uh, price impact, which we know is very special. So intuitively, exchanges allow introducing asymmetries in cross-asset price impacts which we know can be beneficial. Derivatives cannot induce such asymmetries. The price impact is diagonal and, and the price impact per unit is going to be symmetric. Okay, so either innovation may dominate in welfare terms. So this tells us that new financial products and innovation in trading technology cannot substitute as instruments in financial market design. They, they should really be regulated separately. Uh, I, am I really out of time? <laughs> Can, um, yeah, you can finish it up. All right, all right. We, can, uh, we take from the Q and A. All right, okay. Uh, so let me just wrap up. Um, I uh, I focus on centralized versus uh, decentralized, but naturally markets have never been uh, centralized, and these results suggest that uh, it matters. These results suggest that the classical methods based on spanning. And the theorems which rely on them, spanning is the foundation for asset pricing, do not carry over to trading environments in which it is not the case that all assets keep jointly. Okay, so there is space to develop new methods for uh, pricing innovation in trading technology, new financial product, and evaluate the effects of changes in the market structure. Okay, so, so the spanning methods provided us with a representation of uncertainty through the implied state space over which state contingent securities were defined. Um, state contingent pricing isn't helpful when spanning doesn't hold. Okay, so that's, that's uh, what Pierre Oliver uh, asked about. Uh, our approach to characterizing equilibrium as a fixed point in price impacts uh, allows us to introduce new techniques based on projected price impacts, these pre-unit price impacts. And these techniques can be extended to the comparative analysis uh, across different types of innovation through projected price impacts of the matrix representation of the corresponding fixed points. Okay, thank you. I, I, I should really stop now. Thank you. So I mean, can, can I uh, make, make yeah, a comment? Yes, well, we are open for our Q&A right now. So you, you guys can, can go ahead and... Uh, um, one question, um, how robust uh, are your results to um, the endowments being correlated? I understand that you have IID endowments, but uh, have you thought or explored the, 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 the implications of the correlation of the endowments? Uh, thank you. We actually allow for correlated endowments. So there is a common value component in traders endowments because we want to have a well-defined model for uh, uh, the competitive uh, uh, market. We want, the, uh, we want the aggregate endowment to be random in the limit. Um, so, so traders and nomads have a common value component, but the, the values are still private. I see. Okay. So I, I just wanted to make a, little, a comment. I don't, it's not really a question. It's about ancient history. If you, you know, exchanges have thought about these issues for decades, and if you go back to the 1980s when you had human beings on the floor of an exchange, they thought very carefully about traders wanting to arbitrage uh, one futures contract, let's say, against another one. And uh, to make the arbitrage easier, you could put the trading pits side by side. To make it even easier than that, you could make it the same pit. Uh, to make it harder, you could put them in like separate rooms and, and make people not be able to see what was going on in one or the other. And they thought very carefully about that, but the way they, um, uh, their objective function was not to maximize social welfare. Their objective function was to maximize the incomes of the market makers. So they, they wanted to keep the uh, trading venues a little bit separate so that the market makers uh, uh, had a friction that they could exploit, but not too separate because then um, things would start uh, breaking down. So exchanges have thought about these things. Uh, you also see them uh, thinking about introducing automatic spread orders. So some, ex some exchanges have automatic spread orders for trading uh, one contract against another, usually very close substitutes. 
No, that that continues in the uh, electronic markets, but they're more concerned nowadays about maximizing their fee income uh, than in maximizing social welfare. So, so not not clear how it all plays out. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for for. Uh these references, I mean, we, we should um, we should include mm -hmm. that in the paper. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you all for being here, a, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? If we're not out of time. Um, so this is just because I don't know, like uh, given the importance of the assumptions about price impact within versus across uh, exchanges, like what's the state of the empirical literature on measuring these price impacts? Have, has that been done or do you know anything about it? Uh, well, we know that price impact is of first order for incentives. Price impact dominates all the explicit trading costs, commission fees, order processes. No, 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 I mean, I guess, I guess comparing, uh, like, are there estimates about price impact for, uh, across across exchanges? I guess has, has that been done? Oh, I see. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, in in fact, there are uh, new papers by uh, Ralph Klein from uh, uh, the University of Chicago. Is a sequence of papers uh, um, on the estimation of uh, uh, cross exchange price impacts. And I mean, if you are interested, and, and these, these results actually match with uh, uh, the asset pricing properties of the uncontingent model. So, so the price impact matrices are not symmetric as they would be. Okay. I didn't even mention this, but. Uh, but but relaxing the assumption of contingent schedules uh, has implication for the basic asset pricing properties. Uh, equilibrium, uh, the joint distribution of equilibrium prices is not going to be linked to the covariance in, in the same way. Okay, thanks. To build a bit on Milena's and Pierre's question. So if you think from the perspective of the exchange that wants to introduce assets, in some sense, they would like to introduce independent assets because that's gonna um, protect them uh, from traders, whether they wanna trade in contingent schedules or non-contingent schedules, they would give them exactly the same. I guess with independent assets, traders would, they are indifferent between contingent and non-contingent, right? With independent, uh, process and conditioning is neutral, absolutely. Yeah, so in that sense, exchanges would have an incentive to introduce independent assets. On the other hand, if it is very uh, costly to introduce such independent assets, then they probably want to just copy the asset of the other exchange and prohibit contingent schedules. Would that be an implication of the model? I, I would have to think about that. I, I don't have the, that. In, I don't have the same intuition, but I would. I would. I would have to think about it. Um, um, I, I think the answer is no, based on the simple two by two example that I, uh, that I showed. So in general, the incentives depend on uh, what a traders have, uh, how traders demands across assets are aligned, whether traders want to take the same positions or uh, opposite positions on average in, in the assets offered by the exchanges. And uh, these, the, the question will depend on not only on the uh, covariance matrix of the assets offered, but also uh, the traders demands across assets. But I think we should we should think about this more more carefully. I mean, that's really what keeps us up at night uh, to get more predictive results. <laughs> so, um, I think that Milena and Daryl asked something related to this, like what would the market maker do, or who would have the, if the exchange would have the incentives to move towards more um, contingent schedules or not. And there seemed to be a discontinuity in your answer. Like it seemed to be like you don't want everything to be integrated. So but there's, some, there's, right. there's is no, it just at the limit or is it just that it's, so is there a maximum point of integration that you would like or of conditioning that you would like, or is it just exactly at the limit? What, what, how, how does that work? Just to be sure there is no discontinuity, uh, but uh, we do indeed show that intermediate designs, designs uh, fully and contingent where all assets clean independently and fully contingent where all assets clean jointly are uh, optimal. 
and, and heterogeneity in, uh, in the traders' trading needs and the fundamental covariance matrix favor these intermediate designs. So in fact, uh, if you, uh, if you, uh, uh, if you uh, let, let me give you a, a, a very specific environment. Um, the covariance matrix is symmetric. So all previous correlations are identical and all traders uh, needs are ex ante symmetric and the market structure is symmetric. Uh, so the same number on each exchange. So this is a super strong joint symmetry restriction. Then one can show that either the contingent or uncontingent uh, designs are going to be uh, optimal depending on whether assets are uh, complements or substitutes. But if you relax um, um, uh, the symmetry of the, uh, of the covariances, uh, of the correlations, uh, or trading needs, then intermediate designs are going to be optimal under very general conditions. So there is this uh, intuitive support um, of contingent, of, of designs closer to fully contingent uh, for markets in which assets are complements and, uh, and uh, 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 designs closer to uncontingent for markets uh, in which assets are uh, substitutes. But that's a very rough intuition. It's a very rough intuition. The characteristics of uh, traders and assets do matter. Uh, in particular, even if you fix the joint distribution of the asset payoffs and make it as symmetric as you'd like, uh, uh, the trading needs across assets are uh, uh, crucial to understand which design is optimal. Thanks, that clarifies things. Thank you. Thank you, Marzina. Thank you, all our attendees and panelists. Uh, we are going to uh, close the, the seminar now and stop the recording, but thank you, everyone. And we are welcome uh, to, to hang around a little bit longer and, and, and talk about the paper a little bit more. Uh, thank you again. I'll stop the recording.